swam across the ponds of the Kachanga cattle Opened up my guitar case and all the songs were filled Welcome folks, we'll get rolling in just in a couple more minutes mm, Giving folks a little time to join Yeah. Did I change my Learn the language of the mockingbird. She took and twisted all my words. Yeah, I'm just trying to find my way. And I'll meet you in the graveyard with a winter tree down star. Well, hello everyone. We're gonna get started. Just giving Daniel a couple minutes to get the screen share going. Welcome everyone. Lovely to see you here today. So I'm Cecile. I'm one of the co-founders and instructors here at Round Sky Solutions. And thank you for joining our introductory session on facilitating cooperation. I'm excited to, to meet you all today, uh, get to know a little bit more about you, see some familiar faces, and I'm particularly excited to share what we've learned and continue to learn about facilitating cooperation. Um, many of you know us, so I just wanted to share two things about Round Sky. And that's off to you, Daniel. Sorry about that. And just the details here in the background here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Cecile. I'm a little. <laughs> Is there... Apologies, everybody. I have uh, I just just you know I have, I I, uh, I I'm I have COVID, and so I'm a little brain foggy, and uh, I'm here. I'm glad to be here. I'm feeling relatively well, but um, I have a few extra uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> and if you haven't, um, if 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 you are if you're not um muted, uh, please mute yourself just to just check in on that until unless we're asking for uh, feedback. Um, Cecile, I'm sorry, I missed what you're saying uh, because I was doing something else. Where are we? <laughs> Yay! All right, super. Um, we are just getting rolling, and uh, you were going to introduce a little bit about Round Sky. Um, so. Hmm. Okay. Um. I, uh, I, okay, I don't, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I uh, wanted to, am I on the right? Oh, I'm in the wrong script, no wonder. <laughs> <laughs> this is, oh my goodness. Uh, okay, let's, <laughs> I apologize. It's gonna take me a moment, Cecile. Do you feel like you could take away while I find, uh, take that away while I find uh, where we're at? Yes, yeah, no worries. Um... Yeah, so welcome again, everyone, and uh, just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, further background about Round Sky Solutions. We are a remotely operated worker-owned cooperative, meaning that we're a business and the workers in it own it together. 
Um, we believe that there are two main opportunities when building shared leadership and the tools and processes of CoLab, which is the set of processes that we teach, as well as personal development. And I think that, that combining the two of these is part of what makes us unique. Um, even if the tools and processes were functioning quite well for our groups, we still need to address the second aspect, which is personal development to nurture self-awareness, groundedness, and the emotional intelligence in our facilitation. So with that, that leads us to the second thing that we wanted to share. Um, we approach our courses and trainings with this focus on both the hard skills and tools and the soft skills. Um, which can be can considered personal development, um, for example, somatic practices. Uh, so today you'll hear us talk a bit about the Cooperative Leadership Certification Program or CLCP for short. Um, we'll reference some of the tools that we teach in this webinar today to work with um, uh, you know, facilitating uh, cooperation in a way that is in line with your cooperative values. If what we're offering resonates with you um, and, and how you'd like to approach your facilitation, please consider applying. Uh, once you apply, you'll be invited to a more in-depth interview with one of us to see if it's a good fit. And applications are due Friday, September 8th. Super, so let's spend just a couple minutes on logistics. Many of you are familiar with Zoom, but uh, just, just briefly, the session is being recorded and will be shared back with you. Um, if you have questions or comments, um, please put them in the chat box. You can find the chat box in the toolbar, likely on the bottom of your screen, looking like a little um, speaking bubble. And uh, Daniel, if you could type hello in the chat box, uh, we'll give folks a, a place to look. And we'll also leave time for your questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you have technical issues, you can chat me directly. I'm happy to try to help. And please do stay on mute because our mics are really good at picking up background noise, um, unless of course you're speaking and then you have to unmute yourself uh, to do that. And lastly, we only have one quick hour to go over the material. So you may leave with questions, um, which is good. And we will get to what we can today and there'll be more of these events and always happy to connect with you via email. <laughs> Uh, Daniel, are you ready to pick Great. up the breakouts? I think so. Yeah, we're going to we're going to uh, do some breakout rooms soon and uh, let you introduce yourselves to each other. Um, and uh, but first, Cecile and I will also introduce ourselves a little more um, in the breakout rooms. Um, you'll have about four minutes total, you know, just a, a minute or so each to um, to introduce yourself. Uh, you might share your name, pronouns, location. Uh, organizations you're connected with, and what brought you here, including if there's a question you have or a um, or a uh, a question you have or or a topic or experience you want to explore today. And so, before you do that, we'll uh, we'll introduce ourselves a little more as kind of a model in a sense, and uh, and we'll go from there. Um, so yeah, I'm Daniel. I use he him pronouns. I live in Vermont, which is uh, which is the unceded territory of the Abenaki Nation. Um, I'm one of the founders, facilitators, and coaches here at Round Sky Solutions. Mm -hmm. And I've been one, of the, been one of the main instructors for our trainings in the last number of years. What brought me here today is uh, my curious about people. I'm really excited to uh, you know uh, have a meet some of you in a little bit and have a, have a sense of the people in our network. And all of the meaningful work that that you're all creating, and I can relate to this theme of facilitating cooperation. I mean, um, just recently doing a little custom training uh, locally, one of the first uh, in-person gigs, you know, since the pandemic. And um, one of the themes that comes out of that is having a strong, grounded facilitation, so that a cooperative team can feel held in their processes or working together. There's a real sense of like, oh, we need facilitator strength and skills to kind of guide through the process. And as a facilitator myself, I've been finding it really helpful to check in with myself and my body um, as I make choices about how to proceed. Um, and I think that there's uh, there's a way that we can do that in our teams to help us navigate you know, the complexities of our cooperative workspaces. Cecile. Yeah, so I'm, I'm Cecile, my pronouns are she, hers. I also live in Vermont. 
on the home of the Abenaki. And I'm excited to be here today with you all to explore this question of what it means to facilitate cooperation. Um, we all work in these uh, teams and sometimes our experiences work smoothly when we want to cooperate and generate great joy in the process. And at other times, might be difficult or sticky with unspoken tensions and assumptions generating endless conflict and misalignment. So I'm I'm delighted to be here to, to explore some ways to, to lean towards the joyful and, and smooth end of facilitating cooperation. So with that, I'm gonna put you all into breakout rooms and uh, put the prompts for your check-ins into the chat box for you right now so you can see what those are and and enjoy your time you'll have about um let's see and you'll have about seven eight minutes in the breakout so about you know one one and a half minutes per person and enjoy We may have had a few folks that just joined just as the breakout rooms were getting started. Um, we, um, we're just inviting folks to go uh, to just have a little check-in with each other. And um, so we'll, if you're not in a breakout room yet, we'll, we'll assign you to one. And uh, it's just a, it's just a brief arrival and, you know, name, pronouns, your organization and what you're hoping for the call today. All right, still working on getting you into a breakout room. Daniel, I don't know if you can see the breakouts, but I, I don't have the option to assign uh, to a breakout room at the moment. I'm not sure what might be going on, but I'm looking at that. I'll pause the recording momentarily here and start it back up in a minute. Mm -hmm. We're just coming back from breakout rooms. Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. If um, if you haven't um, muted yourself again, do that if you would. And um, now I want to do just a little like grounding and arriving. I call this like our, our somatic arrival, you know, just like arriving in our bodies. One of the things that's really important in facilitating cooperation when we work together is feeling grounded and, uh, you know, allowing ourselves to be really, you know, in the moment with each other, you know, through our bodies. And uh, so I'll just leave a little, little, uh, little grounding exercise or a little, uh, little somatic awareness exercise. And if what I do works for you, please listen and follow along. And if you, uh, if so you, you do something else that works better for you, if you do, do you, do you, and, uh, and do whatever, you know, works for you to help just kind of arrive and be present and grounded. Um, yeah, for myself, um, for myself, I, uh, I like to start with my feet on the floor or with the feeling of my, you know, my legs, my seat and my back and the chair that I'm sitting in. There's something really reassuring about the solidity of the, of the floor of the earth in a sense, and just sensing into how I'm, how I'm tapping into that. So you might, you might, uh, you know, close your eyes if you feel like it or, or not. And uh, just like sense that, sense that earth 
uh, below you, that solidity of chair or ground. You might notice as you do that, that your body relaxes a little bit. Maybe there's a deeper breath. For me, there's, a, there's often this spontaneous deeper breath after feeling my feet. And uh, maybe it's a deeper breath and a little sigh or sound. Oh. From there, you might try opening your eyes and just looking around the space that you're in and just kind of orienting to the place where you are. Just not really being not deliberate about whether you're where your eyes go. Just kind of let your eyes take in the space. In your ears, too. Maybe there's sounds. I can hear the crickets outside my window. And then also the awareness that we're all here together. There's a bunch of us here. And uh, and you know, through 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 far away, far and near in physical space, but here in this, you know, you know, strange virtual environment. Um, so you might turn your attention to the sense that we're all here together. And even, of course, looking at the screen and noticing like the names or the faces of the folks who are here with us today. Uh, yeah. Welcome. Thanks for thanks for being here. Jody, could I get the charger? Oh. wonderful um that that uh brings us now to um i'm going to turn the slides back on and um let cecile take it from here just give me a moment to turn on the screen share here Yeah, you're muted, Cecilia. That's an important detail. Um, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to contextualize our topic for today um, with us all. And being able to metabolize conflict into cooperation is a key feature of a healthy collaborative team, which is easy to say and much harder to achieve consistently. Uh, from my perspective, part of the reason for this lies in the fact that we all have different perspectives, no matter how values aligned we might be. Uh, this difference in perspective arises from the fact that we are each unique people going through life with a different history, a different set of resources at our disposal, and different assumptions about how life works. This difference can actually be a huge resource, um, affording a team the benefit of being able to see issues from multiple angles, which can create better decisions but only if a team knows how to surface and synthesize those perspectives readily. Another reason it is um, difficult to consistently achieve uh, you know, converting conflict into cooperation is that life is quite uncertain. Um, there's always something new and challenging to deal with, no matter how prepared we are. Uh, managing uncertainty with as much clarity as possible without resisting what needs to change can highlight differences and increase the likelihood of conflict. And a third reason is that people have differing ideas about how to cooperate, the mechanics of cooperation. And it can be difficult to create time in our busy organizations to discuss the ground rules for how to cooperate. But without doing that, we inevitably conflict about the basics. For example, do we need all team members to respond to emails within 24 hours or is a week okay? What's our decision-making process? How do we know when we've actually made a decision? How about our accountability processes? Are things falling through the cracks there? Or what do we do with emotionally charged content? These are all incredibly important facets of an effective cooperative organizing system. And in this call, we're mainly focusing on tools to use in, in meeting spaces to collectively work through what's needed based on what your team senses is the direction, not just the lead or the facilitator. So we'll be offer also offering you some ideas on how to use somatics to resource yourself personally and to help your team increase your capacity to facilitate cooperation. So off to Daniel to, uh, to get into our approach number one. Great. Ooh. 
approach number one yes let's get connected to our bodies um uh you know we just did that a bit and we recommend like having a moment of checking in with our bodies right at the beginning of a of a, of a business meeting whatever just so people can arrive really fully um you know taking taking this time for somatic or, orientation you know somatics is about having a body being in our bodies uh, our relationship with our bodies our conversations with our bodies somatics is a term that encompasses you know, historically indigenous orientation to the sanctity and reverence of all that we are, you know, encapsulated with our bodies, you know, our con this connection with our bodies, this relationship to our needs and desires and feelings, all this has been disrupted. It's been eclipsed by our over-reliance on our minds and our society's systems of control and oppression. We're taught to distrust our bodies and prioritize living to external standards. And there are, um, there's so many levels of trauma as well, which makes it hard to know where to begin in trusting our bodies. Fortunately, in recent decades, there's been this resurgence of interest in how our bodies and nervous systems play a crucial role in our ability to be creative and communicate, communicative with others in our lives. And the, this burgeoning awareness of the impacts of trauma on our nervous system gives us new tools of how to work together with more ease. <clears throat> Um, so the body as a resource, you know, it's a source for wisdom and creativity. The body knows things that our conceptual mind doesn't. So it's something we can tap into. And when we choose to respond, uh, to uncertain moments in our facilitation, for example, relying more on our sense of our gut feelings of what to do rather than just our ideas about what's going on. We can use it as a way of rapid centering. And when we're centered, we can then offer that more to others. Uh, somatic centering invites us to become more familiar with and connected to whatever our sensory experience is, while at the same time creating space around it by noticing some of the other things we can possibly feel or do or, you know, in the centering practice we just did. It's like that. It's an opportunity for us to notice, you know, how our own feelings what, what's going on with us to articulate them to the group, you know, as that seems necessary, um, checking in with each other, knowing everyone's emotional and bodily state can help us determine what our capacity is to collaborate, or it can help us uh, inform us how we, how we want to collaborate. Somatics helps us integrate our charged experiences. Somatic work can give us a space to start to process more skillfully uh, you know, difficult emotions that tend to live in the body. When we do this, we can learn more about ourselves and the situation, become more available and empathetic to those experiences in others. And uh, we're less likely to <clears throat> enter into our own reactive states during challenging interactions. It can, so it can give us the skills to express ourselves from our bodies with honesty and to hold space for how others may feel. Um, you know, by just being a little more emotionally and, you know, somatically transparent. Um, it can help us metabolize charged experiences as well by, by developing this greater resilience in the face of conflict when holding space for difficult topics. We can generally have more choice about how to respond. And I want to note that there's a nuance here for traumatic responses that, you know, that we're not we're, um, you know, diff different levels, you know, th there's all different levels of, of, of experience and history coming into a situation in your group and uh, just creating a little more space for that um, is, it can be helpful and uh, help us be more adept in moving into resourceful responses. Mm. And uh, yeah, so we include somatics in our facilitator training, but the essence is that it helps facilitators show up and meet people in situations more fully. In the context of becoming a more skillful facilitator, it's important to check in and be aware of our bodies so we can show up um, fully with our own with our own tensions. We'll talk about tensions in a minute, and the uncertainty of our own, you know, context, you know, and uh, and bring bring some wisdom, hopefully, you know, sourced from from within to the situation. Thank you so much, Daniel. There's uh, so much to learn with somatics, um, so much resource and power in, in learning those things. There's something about moments of conflict when I'm facilitating a cooperative team that I find myself 
you know, wanting to hurry up and figure out how to deal with whatever came up right now. Uh, and when really, if I can tap into my body source of wisdom, I'm noticing that slowing down is actually a really, really useful response. Um, and that when things feel urgent in our meetings, a breath, a pause, slowing down, um, this looks like taking a breath when I'm feeling myself getting scattered or defensive or rushed and asking for the group to pause as well when I notice we're not listening and get curious about my own assumptions and how I'm showing up. Additionally, I have a few prompting questions for you to make a note of and, and reflect out of this call. Um, I'm curious, like, how do you personally relate to somatics? What do you notice in your body when you're facilitating or working with conflict? How does this change in different contexts or situations for you? And what are your tactics for regrouping, grounding, thinking creatively, or setting boundaries for these moments um, so that you can build up your collective um, capacity through, through integrating more somatic capacity? So the second approach we wanted to share with you is what we call using tension-driven meetings. Um, so we've built some of these connecting somatic moments into our collaborative meeting practices. And one of the things we found in our research and in our work with, with clients is that meetings are a core place where dysfunction, disconnection, and lack of alignment can be amplified. It actually becomes a bit louder. And it's one reason why people hate meetings. Uh, so, however, meetings can also be a place for connection, moving work forward, of course, and a way to show up for each other. Um, the key is to making our meetings highly relevant and responsive to our team's actual needs. So we've designed an optimal flow for a meeting process, which includes a bunch of key elements that help us facilitate cooperation. Um, the, the most fundamental here at the moment is that having an agreed upon format for your meetings and how they'll be, be run really helps to facilitate cooperation since everybody can get on the same page as to what to expect and when. And you can see that outline here on the screen, but today we're gonna focus on just one part of that, the process that we call agenda building or tension surfacing. In the Cooperative Leadership Certification Program, um, we're gonna dive deeply into each of these sections and students get a chance to really practice them and understand how they work and the nuances behind them. There's quite a lot of detail um, behind them. And if facilitation and having more tools for working with cooperative teams is on your list of things you wanna improve and strengthen, then this course is a great place to get some concrete improvement and methods for facilitating cooperative leadership and management and get a chance to practice all that um, in the course. So what I wanna to share today is a method for participant-centered agendas um, that we call the tension-driven meeting practice, a practice that we learned from Holacracy. In order to effectively cooperate, essentially we all need, we need all of these perspectives on our team to be put on the table. And we need clear processes for being able to metabolize those tensions and synthesize those perspectives. We do this through a process that lets everyone in the meeting build the agenda in real time with each other and then prioritizing together what is most important to focus on today. And there's two features to this process, which I'll name right now, and then we'll go into a little more detail together. Um, first of all, is an invitation for everyone to bring forward what they want to address. And we want to encourage this to be at least in part a bodily sensing of what we or the organization needs. And we, we call these motivations that people are sensing tensions. It's essentially the difference between where we are and where we want to be. And this, the second thing is that we have an agreed upon place in our meeting practice, a way for us to collect what we are each individually sensing and turn that into beneficial outcomes for the team. So let's get a little deeper into what we mean by sensing tensions, because it can sound a little woo-woo, but it's actually very, very practical. Um, during the course of every meeting, we offer everyone the opportunity to sense anything that they may, may be on their mind and then add it to the agenda as items. This is a mind-body approach to noticing what I feel motivated to bring up for the team for consideration. I see tensions as creative potential action. Um, tensions in our view is something we're sensing that could be different. And, and there's a sense of like 
possibility there, uh, just wanting to find direction and action. We can we can see this a bit like an archery metaphor. You know, each person's creative contribution is their arrow, and their attention is pulling them and the bowstring back to take aim at a target. And as facilitators, our job is to support people in surfacing or bringing up these tensions and then guiding members through activities to process them. We're helping the arrow find its target. So you're probably familiar with the term, you know, feel the tension in the room, except that it, rather than it being something to avoid, it's something to name and invite. It may be in the room or maybe just in something one person is noticing. And it's important to remember, we're not talking about tensions as a negative thing. It's just a neutral description of this potential energy. They can even be pleasurable, like uh, excitement or, or joy, say for the possibility of a new exciting project, or they can be more difficult, like feeling uncertain or stuck or in conflict, or perhaps we haven't decided what path to take. And so there's this ambivalence and we need to move. Tensions can be as simple as asking questions where resolving them is just sharing information, or they can be motivations that in the end lead to radical change in the ways that we operate together. Great. So what, what do you do with tensions, right? So before we get before getting into the agenda section of our meeting, we have the facilitator ask the question, does anyone have any agenda items they'd like to put add to the agenda? Or does anyone have any tensions they'd like to surface? We're typically working from off working from a shared document um, and either the scribe for the meeting or the team members themselves can add a short title for their agenda item right to the list of items to consider. Or perhaps it can be written on a large sticky note or a whiteboard. Um, an important note is that we always have a tension holder for each item. The tension holder both identifies the tension and decides when the tension has been moved forward, uh, as we'll learn more about in a minute. Um, we always ask this question at each meeting based on what people are sensing, but unaddressed tensions from last, previous meetings can be brought forward again by the tension holder until they are addressed. Um, so what do we do with these tensions here? We, um, we This is an example of a, of a Google Doc that we use, we call the Living Agenda. And um, so everyone has the opportunity to get their tensions on the agenda. This is um, this living agenda. We have a template for which, which uh, Cecile will maybe you'll share that link in the chat box. You're welcome to use a use our template and turn it into your own. Um, um, if it's not clear what the item is about, we ask the tension holder to briefly introduce their item, much like in ten seconds or less. And then once the agenda is built, the facilitator chooses an item to start with. Uh, in an informed way, you know, informed by the collective, um, uh, we often like, you know, have a indicators like a little poll, basically, so that if, so that we can understand if there's things that are urgent, you know, that folks need to get addressed uh, more quickly, things like that. But the facilitator um, chooses an agenda item, and then we can use other process tools like integrative consent, which we teach in the training, to effectively move that tension forward um, towards resolution for the person that's brought it forward. It's like the one person brings something forward and the team is supporting them to get that moved along in some way that's you know both good for the person who brought it up and for the for the the, the collective as a whole. And once the team has some practice with this, they can also add agenda items ahead of time. Like we this is just a document that we have available. So so yeah, so just like a few minutes ago, I had a I had something I wanted to address in a meeting that I'm having tomorrow. I went in there and I put it on the agenda for tomorrow so that I, you know, I knew that I, it would, I wouldn't forget, you know, in the meeting to add that to the agenda. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Super. So I, I want to take a moment to let this all sink in for us before we move on. And um, to do that, I want to invite you to think about a team meeting on your radar. So something that's coming up or has just recently had something recent um, and what tensions you might bring to that meeting or you wished you had brought to that meeting. And while you reflect on that, I'm going to open up a whiteboard and we'll give you some practice using this reframe around tensions in, in, in these kinds of meetings. Um, so if you can think of a tension, um, then then and go ahead and put it on the whiteboard and we'll do a little demo here. Um, 
And as soon as the whiteboard is open and up. So let's let's see. Can you guys see that already? Yay. Awesome. So feel free to click on the little icons on the left. There's a text box there. It's kind of the easiest one. Click on the text and then uh, click on the, the board itself. And a little, capital, a little capital T stands for text. You click, click on that, you can like write in a, write or something in. Yes. So feel free to practice just adding attention to this whiteboard here, for example. Um, let's see, um, I'll put out, wait, oh, this is very small. Um, let's oh, there's a, there's a, um, there's a, uh, zoom down in the bottom right corner for, if anyone wants to make it bigger, there's a little percentage symbol. You can make that up to a different size to make it, make it easier to read. Okay. Super. Looks like we're getting some some examples up there. Thanks all for contributing. One thing, we, one thing we didn't mention, which isn't so important for today for our example, but we always put our name after our attention because we say we have attention holder. In practical terms, that means we need to put our name or initials or something like that after you know at the end of each attention so that we know when you know, also as a facilitator and the rest of the team are going through the items we know who to turn to you're like oh that's daniel's item let's ask you know ask daniel what uh what, you know what, what's what's needed to move that forward nice oh it's awesome to see these popping up here super well th thanks thanks for playing folks and um there's a question in the box and uh, is, is attention always a conflict or is it more so the item that people want to address? It's more so an item that people want to address. Sometimes it's about a conflict, not always. Um, one way that I like to think about this is that um, when we have this type of meeting practice where we're generating agenda items from what we're sensing, we tend to catch items that might become conflict much sooner in the game and or and 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 be able to process that into something concrete and and useful for the team um long before it becomes something difficult to deal with so all right i'm going to close the whiteboard here and thanks for playing folks yeah super so I want to I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about some of these benefits and and Michelle thank you for that question external community tensions uh it, I probably need to hear a little bit more about your context so maybe um if if what I say now doesn't address that let's bring it up in the Q&A um which we'll have shortly but um Typically, you would want someone to have to be a representative of those community tensions to show up in the meeting and hold that tension on behalf of the whole community. Um, so absolutely, we want to be receptive and listening for tensions wherever they're coming from. Um, but we need a, a, an in individual on the team to hold that and, and represent it and, and move it through for the whole team. So some of the benefits of, of, of this, this type of agenda building and processing is that um, by utilizing our collaborative, collaboratively designed meeting practice along with tensions means that you can show up to just about any meeting ready to facilitate knowing that together you can do a good job and it will be super relevant for the team, right? Um, and it's a practice that also efficiently invites all team members to bring forward what's on their mind with respect to their team, from celebrations to things that aren't working, impediments, stagnations, our personal lives, um, which allows us to support each other in creating solutions and moving forward together. It also builds and subtly demands engagement as everyone gets on the same page. Um, it also gives people more agency over how to move their desires for change forward, and it relieves the burden of one person preparing an agenda. And frankly, it's wonderful to get to collectively decide what gets discussed through voting on the agenda, which is um, a technique that we don't really have time to show you all here today, but we definitely get into it in the course. 
So in sum, we suggest that you try reframing your meetings with tensions to get at the heart of the matter and source your agendas from your team to align on the work together, to tap into those needs on your team and to build engagement across space. So my own reflections about being in tension-driven meetings is that trust is paramount and it can be built through reliably surfacing and processing tensions together. Um, it can sometimes feel like a lot of responsibility to bring tensions forward if you or your team is not used to this type of process or format. If you're used to, say, having a team lead or a manager do it, I would suggest easing into the process, process you know, um, take it slow. Um, really being somatically discerning of whether something has been moved forward or not for you is also part of the process because it's, it's, um, quite tangible when you've got attention and, and it's been moved forward, um, you can actually sense that there's sort of a, a release. There's a settling down in your nervous system that can happen from that. Um, but you also know that you can revisit the, the attention or agreement or output that was made as a result at any time. Um, if you're holding this as a regular practice, then you have a regular time to come back and address anything. Um, instead of trying to get it perfect right now. Um, so as a facilitator, it's important to give the tension holder time and space to process their tensions. Uh, and you can also offer suggestions um, if the tension holder doesn't really know how they want to address the tension or ask the group for wisdom. Know that some people in some tensions need more time and space for processing. Great. Thanks, Cecile. Um, I want to presence that managing the role of facilitator in cooperative settings needs all kinds of approaches. You know, during this webinar, we've offered a few tools, and in our course, we go deeper into somatics and facilitating your group's tensions. We also work with personal development and how you want to grow as a person to better show up as a facilitator and team member. Um, in addition, managing power and distributing decision-making power and work through roles also helps us gain clarity about how we want to work together creatively and collectively. <clears throat> I often tell applicants to our training that participants learn these process tools in order to build alignment and transparency through participation. Our tools are particularly good at helping groups experiment together, identify next steps, and to bridge individual sensing with the collective needs and uh, moving things forward. A next step for yourself is to consider how you might bring these aspects into your leadership to increase your ability to facilitate responsiveness in your team and in yourself. If this resonates and you're curious to learn more with us this fall, uh, submit your application. Um, we're, uh, we'd love to see that. And um, uh, they're, they're um, pardon me. Uh, and we'd love to have a conversation with you about how you can integrate uh, these tools and um, and perhaps join our cohort this fall. Applications are due September 8th, and uh, we'll have interviews with each of you one-on-one uh, -on -one just to see, is this a good fit? Is this, you know, how can we support you um, and uh, in your own learning process around cooperation and facilitation? Um, let's see, applications are at the bottom of the page. Uh, there's a link that Cecile will copy into the chat. And um, yeah, feel free to check that out and, uh, and join us if that feels, if you feel, if you feel called to that. Super, so we've got some time for Q and A. And I noticed one question came through that I don't think, maybe a couple of them came through, so. Let's start with those and then um, feel free to either put questions in the chat box or raise your hand. I'm happy to, to have you have a dialogue here on this call too. So question from Marie, does this approach happen in the moment uh, before a meeting? How do you balance the following the tension, tensions, what feels relevant that day with being prepared to discuss certain items which may require advance notice? Okay, super. Wonderful questions. Um, Daniel, do you want to take a, a crack at those? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I, th I think there's a few things, and maybe you'll have some ideas too, Cecile. But um, but yeah, like uh usually there's a like 
something that needs preparation, like what feels relevant today might be to like get something going, right? So like I might come with attention to like initiate a new project or something like that, but we're not going to plan the whole project. Maybe what it needs is just maybe the output of that tension is to assign it to assign some initial planning to somebody to like begin to make an outline of what the project actually needs and bring that back next week, you know, or something like that. So um, and then it would be there, that person who did the project, they'd have attention at that point too. Their attention would be, I need to present this information now that I've done it, you know, so they could it kind of continue, continue driving uh, forward that way based on what people are sensing is needed. Um, and of course, we have roles too within our organization, right? And so sometimes a role is going to have a particular, like say I'm the finance lead of some sort in my organization. I'm going to have tensions that come up around the financial stuff all the time. And that might, my tension might be, oh, I need to present this report. So I'm going to prepare for it and bring it, you know, or, or might be, um, or, they, or they just might have an attention for that domain of the business, you know, um, and in which case they're going to be it's going to be on their mind to bring up things uh, that you might need planning or might be able to be resolved right away. Yeah, that's great. I would just add, there's also the option of like, you know, creating the information that you, you need people to absorb before the meeting and saying, Hey, here it is. We can advance. Be sure to read it before the meeting. Um, so there's lots of ways to prepare ahead of time. Um, uh, thank, thanks for that. That's great. Um, and yes, um, Camila, you asked, uh, building on meeting topics from one meeting to the next. Absolutely. So um, the, you know, sometimes even we, do, we don't get to the entire agenda. So we invite people to always scan the, 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 the meeting before. And remember, we're working off of a, a, what we call living agenda, which is a Google Doc that is, you know, got the newest meeting stacked at the top and the rest are below it. So historically, um, we have a thread we can scan back easily and, and see. And to pull up any items that are not addressed or were partially addressed or need addressing again. And so there's a very active engagement with the sort of the historical context that we're holding these meetings within. Good questions. Okay, here's another one. Um, I was hoping to gain more insight into the CERT program. Is there a sliding scale or a set rate? I'm trying to assess if it's realistic for our, our organizational PD budget. Uh, right. Short answer, yeah. You want to go for it, Daniel? Sure. Yeah. the um, The base price is two thousand five hundred dollars for the training, and we are um, available to do some amount of scholarships and sliding scale type of you know like payment plans and things like that. So in the application, you'll notice there's a little space like you know, is this something the organization can like afford and pay for right up front, or do you need to talk further about you know financial support and um, so yeah, we're very open to uh, trying to make it work as best we can. Yeah, thanks for that question. It's a good one. Um, here's another question uh, from Richard. How important is it to have the whole group learn about buy into the approach method, such as a choice to shift from consensus to holacracy? Um, great question, Richard. I, I would offer that, um, Yes, you do need some amount of group alignment. However, uh, there's chicken and egg problem, right? Because not everybody may want to take the time to really fully learn the method before they say, yes, I'm willing to try it. Um, so that is typically how I frame it is a, hey, are you willing to try this for a certain period of time? Um, and, that, and that within that trial period, it's, it's long enough for people to really get a sense of how the whole thing works because within a, a complex uh, adaptive system like CoLab, um, there are many, many, many parts that, that fit together and inform and influence each other. And so it's Im almost impossible to learn it all at once, um, especially since it's so practical, you learn it by doing, um, it takes time to sort of see all the parts. And so I recommend just getting a willingness to participate in an experiment, set a date, whatever, three, six months in the future where you will review how it's going and, and make adaptations at that point if you'd like to. 
one of the things that's often helpful about that too is, you know, depending on the size of the organization, perhaps there's a pilot team, a particular work group or particular team or something like that, that wants to be like the guinea pigs to try this on and they, they do it and see how it works. And then they, because they know the rest of the organization, they can then be the advocates for how, how and what of this, these systems, you know, would, would transfer out to the rest of the, to the organization. Super. Another question from Michael. I would guess that even though the agenda would be set cooperatively using these techniques, the topic or broader domain and aim of the group's context would be help would helpfully restrict and focus what is relevant. Got it. <laughs> yes. Um, thank you for presencing this. It's absolutely vital to know who is meeting, why are we meeting, what context within which are we meeting. Um, and to have it actually written down as, as a concrete, what, what we like to think of as a, a scope of work, like what's the scope of work within which we're meeting. Um, if that isn't clear, you're inviting all types of confusions and potential, you know, people sensing and, and surfacing tensions that don't relate to that scope, um, which by way of learning is fine. It's just that it's, um, if you notice that tensions are getting surfaced that don't pertain to the context within which we're meeting, you can make a next action to be like, take this to the context that these do belong. Um, so, um, awesome. And another one from Marie. Thank you. That's helpful. Sounds like it's not incompatible with advanced prep set agenda items, but that those can be adapted based on the tensions present people's feelings of the day. Daniel, do you want to take that one? Um, uh, I have to read it again here. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll just say absolutely yes. Um, and in fact, teams can have their own agreements around, um, please get your, your uh, items up by Monday, for example, maybe that's two days ahead of the meeting. And then you still do a little bit more in the meeting, um, including perhaps voting, because then we really know what's like, what's, what's important for today. Um, but yeah, you can, you can definitely do a blend of, of these two before and during uh, agenda building practices. And, um, and when, and when we say voting in that context, we mean just like taking a poll basically for what's like urgent that we need to address today versus what's like, what are we, people would, what would people like to get to today? You know, Cause there's almost always more to do than we can do in any particular meeting. So we have to put things in a certain order. And um, often we, often the facilitator in our system, you know, gets input from the rest of the group, you know, about how, you know, what things feel particularly uh, vital to get to sooner. Super. Loving these questions and engagement and comments, everyone. It's fantastic. Thank you. Another one from Michael. Um, maybe we try to rush a bit and both decide to do something and to try it to do it too fast. And the somatic agenda setting practice could be done recursively, even within the same meeting to expand an agenda item, follow up, et cetera. Um, cool ideas and perspectives. Thanks for sharing. Absolutely. You got it, Michael. Um, that's exactly what the idea is, is to use the recursive features here to help us um, both stay stay in, in close contact with reality, what's really up for people and, and to metabolize it, um, but just enough. And then we'll come back and metabolize it some more if we need to, but only as far as we need to. Um, yeah, and, and this gets, it, it gets quite intuitive with practice once you integrate the ideas. Um, and, and it kind of makes meetings a bit more of like dance-like um, once, once we've integrated it. All right, time for a couple more maybe from Hillary. We have, do you find that using the word tension is helpful or necessary for the practice given that the topics are not always tensions or conflicts? I worry that it could be off-putting or a barrier to uptake or people being open to doing a new way, new way of doing things. Um, yeah. Yeah, can I can I come in on this? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I I mean I agree, and we've heard this a lot from folks. There's it's a, it's a such a laden word, and it has such other meanings. We're trying to like reclaim it as just this kind of like basic sense of like, you know, like 
potential, you know, because even when I'm excited, there's tension too, right? Or when I'm like, you know, like like really gung ho, that's a that's tension too. So we're trying to like reframe it, but but yeah, I mean, you can just call it agenda items, you know, you know, like do you have an agenda? You have something you want to get on the agenda? You know, it doesn't have to be, uh, don't have to frame it as tensions. Um, we find that that's helpful in many ways to kind of like when we're you know when we're teaching it to kind of get at the nuances of what this is, but. Um, but yeah, sometimes we've heard that before, for sure. That you know, is there a new word we could use? And maybe there is. If you if you if you know it, if you if you discover it, let us know. <laughs> well, we're we're at one o'clock. If any of you need to jump, please do. But we do have one more um, question. We'll t we'll take it and then and then officially wrap. Um, this is from Jess. Does the facilitator hold? any responsibility of filtering items brought that may be interpreted as incendiary and not appropriate? Lovely question. Um, short answer is uh, we recommend giving your facilitator that kind of power um, to uh, to decide you know, which agenda items we're actually gonna get through. Even after we've all built it and we've voted, the facilitator is the one to decide how, you know, the flow of items and you know, if an item isn't gonna be addressed. However, in particular with items that are incendiary, I uh, just wanted to mention that um, the facilitator can say, hey, this is present in the group, I wanna name it, right? Um, and and let's schedule a separate time to address this. We're not gonna do this right now. Um, and that's, that's often a really important thing to do because then people know that whatever is coming up for them, especially emotionally charged items aren't being ignored or, you know, pushed away, but they're given, they're being given the right place and the right time, basically. So it might be a different process tool than what we might typically use in a, in our regular kind of businessy meeting. Mm -hmm. It might need a, a, you know, a conflict resolution, you know, an interpersonal mediation process or something like that, you know, I don't, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, everyone. It's been a delight to engage with you here today. Please do feel free to reach out um, and we'll be sending a follow-up email with uh, this recording. And uh, yeah, we'd just love to be in touch. Uh, any questions, any comments? Thanks Thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. And if you feel like it, you could uh, unmute and just you know shout you know, goodbye or thank you, or whatever is on your mind. And uh, look, I'm really happy to have that you all come today. Thank you. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.